Hello and welcome to this week's A Disciples Tidbit. So what I want to talk about today is what is ever present in the news right now. You probably have heard that Russia has invaded Ukraine, right? And that's an ongoing thing that's going on. And I'm recording this probably a week away from releasing this tidbit. So who knows what may happen between here and there. But it's got a lot of people in the Christian community who are prophecy minded, meaning that they are looking for the literal fulfillment of the end times prophecies to actually occur and occur very soon. They're like, oh my gosh, this is the beginning of Gog Magog. And some of you may wonder what in the world that actually means. Well, there is a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, who is an Old Testament prophet right before the exile into Babylon, the uh, kingdom of Judah, who comprised of the Israelite tribe of Judah and Benjamin to go into exile into the nation of Babylon for 70 years. He was a guy who was prophesying right before then, and he made a lot of of latter days prophecies meaning end times prophecies one would be about the new covenant which can be prolifically found in ezekiel 36 and 37 and at the end of ezekiel 39 but then he prophesied of a massive invasion that would take place of the nation of israel that we have not seen anywhere near the likes of at all yet so a lot of people also believe this is a latter day prophecy mostly because it is said in Ezekiel 38, in the latter days, meaning that basically in the end times, the very end of everything, right before everybody's resurrected kind of thing, that this thing would take place. I'm going to read part of it, and then I'm going to give you some real world headlines that could very well be what we see uh, in terms of a literal fulfillment of this. In Ezekiel chapter 38, starting verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophecy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So, okay, there are some words and titles thrown around there that we're like, huh, what does that mean? So Gog is probably an actual individual, could be even a potential demonic spirit who is behind an actual individual. And uh, elsewhere in Ezekiel 28, we see that there is an individual that is being addressed. And then clearly Ezekiel is looking behind the power of that individual that is motivating them and is believed to be Satan himself, right? Uh, but going back to Ezekiel 38, Gog is likely some individual that God has in mind. Magog is an area known as present-day Kazakhstan and parts of Russia. Meshek and Tubal is modern-day Turkey, if you look geographically. Um, so he's talking about those areas there, basically Russia and the nation of Turkey that we know right now. So basically, the one who is principally behind this invasion is going to be a leader of Russia because that's where Magog was geographically located in his present day Russia. So you can see why people are getting all excited going and not necessarily they're excited for war, but they're excited to see that God is actually starting to work out everything in culmination and that Christians will likely see the physical manifestation of their salvation and their faith totally realized. That's why they're excited. In verse 4, and I will turn around, turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, which is modern-day Iran, Cush and Put, which is around modern-day Libya, are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes. Also is, some say it's an area of Turkey, others say it's present-day Germany. Beth to Garma, which is again an area of Turkey, from the uttermost parts of the north with all of his hordes. Many people are with you. Okay? So this is a factor. This is a multinational alliance coming together against Israel. The key is, is the hook in the jaw. And you'll hear a lot of Christians talk about that. The hook in the jaw is this. I'm going to give you a couple modern day uh, and I'm not saying thus saith the Lord here, but I'm saying this is a potential hook in the jaw. So clearly, because of the consequence of what Russia is doing in the nation of Ukraine in invading a sovereign country, not only are nations boycotting Russia, we have, as the United States, are now stopping to get Russian oil. Businesses the world over 
are stopping businesses with Russia, right? It's basically trying to hurt them where, uh, hit them where it hurts without potentially igniting World War III and trying to coerce them via their pocketbooks. Um, and oil and gas has been one of the biggest thing that has been driving the Russian economy. But here in the Jerusalem Post, it says, can Israel become Europe's gas supplier? The subheadline, with Europe realizing its complete dependence on Russian gas, and if played with the right cards, the crisis in Ukraine can be an opportunity for Israel's gas exportation to Europe. And in Fox Business, there's another headline that says the uh, Chevron CEO says natural gas pipeline from Israel to Europe could help alleviate shortage. Subheadline Chevron is also ramping up domestic production in the U.S. Permian Basin. So that's kind of an, a uh, kind of something else that he's talking about there. But basically that since Russia's biggest export that fuels their economy is gas and oil, and everybody is saying now that Israel could be the replacement, not only that, but Russia is being more and more uh, isolated by the world. Could it be, could it be, the hook in the jaw be Israel's gas supply that brings them down? But again, it kind of, not saying thus say it the Lord, it kind of doesn't necessarily explain the whole, um, why would Turkey then be involved? Why would Iran? It's kind of uh, self-explanatory to see because they hate Israel. They have repeatedly said it should be wiped off the map, and they are also a producer of oil themselves, right? So Turkey is to some degree, but they are also an, a member of NATO, so it's not clear on how that would come about and whatnot. Um, Libya and the other nations are probably sitting here saying we could get some of this spoil too. But interestingly enough, um, some people say that this isn't necessarily ready to be fulfilled because in verse seven, be ready and keep ready. You all of your hosts that are assembled with you and be a guard for them. After many days, you will be mustered, mustered again in the latter years. You will go against the land that is restored from war. The land whose people are gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which has been a continual waste. Mark Twain actually toured the nation or what was considered Palestine back then in the 19th century, and he said it was an absolute wasteland. In Ezekiel 37, it was prophesied that the nation, that the land itself would be revitalized by the people coming back to the nation. What have we seen? In May 14, 1948, Israel was reproclaimed a nation again, right? They necessarily haven't been restored from war. So that's where some people are saying this is not necessarily going to be filled just yet. Okay. Um, its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. Is Israel necessarily sitting in the land in total security? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. The people of Israel sometimes do have to kind of run for cover from rockets that are th sent them uh, from Hezbollah and Hamas. But realistically, most of them probably do live in security because of the fierceness of the IDF, right? The other point I want to make is that later on in this chapter, it talks about the motivations behind the Ezekiel War, right? In verse 13, it says, Sheba and Dadon, which is believed to be the areas of Saudi Arabia, the merchants of Tarshish, which is believed to be the area of Great Britain, and all its leaders or young lions, believed to be potentially America, will say to you, have you come to seize spoil? Have you assembled your host to carry out plunder, to carry with silver and gold, to take away the livestock and goods, and to seize great spoil? What do we see now with Russia invading Ukraine? We just see the protesting of the world. We don't see military action against them. We're just protesting. And when this future war happens, that's what exactly is going to happen. They're saying, are you going to get great spoil? Are you going to get their natural gas supply? I don't know. Not saying, let's say it the Lord, but it's an interesting thought and idea. That is the only relevance, to be quite honest, that Russia's current invasion of Ukraine has any biblical significance. It could could lead to Ezekiel 38 being literally fulfilled if Russia feels isolation from the world and if they actually build an alliance and if Israel actually does start basically becoming Europe's supplier of natural gas at that point, will it encourage Russia to go ahead and go for it? We'll have to wait and see.
At this point in the podcast, I want to reach out to you. And if you have never done so, if you have never entered into a saving relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that today. All you need to do is believe. Believe that Jesus was who he said he was. He was God in the flesh. Believe in your heart that he died for your sins and rose from the dead. Confess him as Lord. And the Bible says that you will be saved if you do that. If you truly believe in your heart that Jesus is who he said he was and that he did exactly what he said he would do for you, you will be saved. It is simply that easy. A lot of people say prayer, prayer. And that's great to confess and put your mind and your heart and everything through a process, if you will, to be able to embody what's already taken place in your heart. By simply saying, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. And now I confess you as Lord. Please take control of my life, and I want to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's all you need to do, and your life will change. Your life will change, not necessarily materially, not necessarily in terms of the world, but your life will change as far as your relationship with God, and you can know for certain that you're saved. The Apostle John wrote that when he was pinning 1 John. He says, I write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you can hope, not that you can wonder, but that you can know. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. <laughs>